coal has been here, oh, at least a hundred years. <laughs> this is not a, a singular thing in one place. This is systemic throughout the entire U.S. You can't fully ignore it. It's there. So when you see giant piles of coal, you're going to pay attention to it in some way, shape, or form. Why is this being allowed? How is this going to affect future generations? What does this entire system look like? My name is Dr. Johnny Finn. I'm an associate professor of geography. Um, in my research, I focus on the history of racial segregation in American cities, and especially on how that history kind of reverberates through the present day in terms of racial, economic, and environmental inequality and injustice. The coal facility that is just on the kind of the west end of Southeast Newport News is one of really dozens of environmental toxins surrounding one of the most marginalized communities in the city. My name is Asa Townsend. I came here in 2013 to come to college. I spent one year out of town, but then I pretty quickly came back because uh, this place felt like home to me. A couple things that I've picked up on, I realize that their main function is to transport, which is fitting because of where they're located, right? I mean, we can get the coal onto trains, we can get it onto boats or barges, and I think Newport News and Norfolk export possibly more coal than any other location in the US. My name has been Kenley Price, born here in Newport News. I've been mayor now going on 12 years. As it comes in on the train, it is placed, depending upon the grade, in various piles. So companies or industries own or lease various plots where that coal is stored. Some of that coal is used to generate power, and some of that coal is used as like a metallurgic coal for the process of steel making. Having those things, the existence of a coal terminal or a shipyard or a garbage incinerator lowers the value of land surrounding it, which effectively economically pushes lower income communities closer to those areas and creates a situation in which in order to buy yourself away from this environmental toxin, you have to have the economic resources to do so. On the one hand, facilities target black, brown, and low-income communities partly out of probably conscious and unconscious racism, and also partly out of the fact that they know these communities have the least economic and political clout to fight back. I would love to believe that organizations do everything that they can to make sure that those potential negative effects is mitigated in some way, shape, or form. They are a company that has made sure that the regulations as far as environmental controls that the state puts on them have been sought. But I don't know to what extent the coal depot is going above and beyond. Maybe they're doing what they have to do and, and maybe that's it. No matter what controls you have on dust and whatnot, there's going to be dust. I mean, I live in this community as well, and always on my back porch, there's always dust that we have to wash down and whatnot. So you figure if it's on furniture, if it's in your yard, it's also going to get into your lungs and into your system. And what you see on this map, the geography of asthma, is largely the same as the racial geography. And so we can start to kind of suss out these relationships or these correlations between the production of racial inequality, the production of economic inequality, and how it has impacts on different kinds of health indicators, including, in this case, asthma. My name is Angela Harris, born and raised in Newport News, Virginia. When we talk about environmental justice, we're taking a holistic approach that is not just the natural, it's the political, the cultural, the economical, as well as the spiritual. I would like to see funding placed, knowing what the future is going to be for a company like this. So when we stop using coal as a resource, being able to change the environment back to what it was. We can't just pretend that if the coal depot just magically disappeared tomorrow, that everything would be fixed. And so if we engage in a more gradual transition towards cleaner energy, that company will be forced to either adjust to do something cleaner, or they will shrink over time. Most people, if it doesn't affect them directly, they don't care about it. They have no desire or interest in, in trying to pursue. That's somebody else's problem. 
Well, you know, it doesn't affect me. I don't have any coal on my furniture. My car is clean. Everybody have a, a role at the table, and that way we can all move from a position of strength. People can help with this endeavor by letting their legislatures know that this is here, having them to think forward thinking about how they're going to change this and about the future when this does occur. There's a great opportunity for this city and CNU to be in relationship with one another to be able to describe how the student population does actually have a vested interest and can have a relationship with the city. Yeah, I think CNU students would be best served if they would come and take a tour. Look at what is affecting the community that you're in. If you're claiming your residence here at CNU, you can vote in Newport News. <laughs> that matters. So you can talk to local representatives. You can meet people that can teach you a whole lot about what's going on. Look at the potential of what this could be. I mean, we've, we're waterfront, deep water. This could be a small Manhattan. Think of that. But it's not going to happen until the funding is available to clean this environment up. So I think it would benefit not only the city of Newport News, but the region for the potential of what this property could be.